Good morning, church. We are so glad that you are joining us for another time of online worship. I've got some great news. This week, we are starting the process of regathering. Uh, there are still some guidelines that we need to follow, so I'm going to put those on the screen right now. Uh, on Sunday, May 24th, will be our first Sunday back together. Uh, we'll have no Sunday school, no nursery, uh, no choir, just one time of corporate worship together at 1045 in the sanctuary. Uh, we are asking that those of you that are uh, feel like you may be more high risk to please park in the front parking lot. That way you can just walk straight into the sanctuary without having to go into the lobby or anything like that. Um, and then on Wednesday night, the 20th, our adult prayer meeting uh, will meet for the first time also here in the sanctuary uh, and following those, sa those same social distancing guidelines. Guys, we are so excited to start this process of regathering. We have missed you so much. We can't wait to have you back here in the sanctuary to worship together. Uh, but for now, let's prepare our hearts to worship today online by going to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for another time to worship you. Uh, God, we uh, are so excited to be able to meet together as a church body. Uh, and we praise you for that. God, we ask that you continue to watch over us and to uh, make your presence known to us. Uh, that we would feel you in our lives each day. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final podcast uh, of Bellevue Baptist Church. And when I say the final podcast, I mean where I'm standing in front of an empty auditorium and preaching the gospel to empty seats because the good Lord willing, next Sunday, you'll be able to come and to uh, sit here and to worship the Lord Jesus Christ with us as a matter of fact uh, we're going to open up Wednesday night prayer service beginning this coming Wednesday night so uh, just make your plans to come and to be with us now there are certain precautions that uh, will have to be taken and uh, you can read those and see those uh, on our Facebook and web page so you might turn over there and and look at those precautions that we'll be putting into place beginning Wednesday night and then to continue next Sunday and for the next uh, few Sundays. Uh, These precautions uh, have been prayed over and well thought about and therefore your safety and and we want to make sure that everyone comes and feels comfortable uh, as we worship the Lord together. So it'll begin at six o'clock this Wednesday and then next Sunday at 1045 our normal morning worship service and we do uh, urge you to come now if you still have some concerns uh, about whether to come and be in a crowd or not maybe uh, you uh, have some underlining uh, medical issues and and you're just not sure about whether to come then our morning worship service is going to be live streamed Uh, on our Facebook page and you can go there and uh, just click on the uh, right spots and you'll be able to pick up the morning worship service. Now if you're unable to do that Sunday morning it'll be posted on our uh, Facebook page and one day next week you'll be able to bring it up and to look at it. And if you have trouble doing that just call the church and I'm sure that uh, Brandon Uh, would be more than willing to kind of talk you through the process that you need to uh, uh, watch our worship service uh, next Sunday morning. Well, if you have your Bible, I want you to open it up this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And while you're doing that, I want to just go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask God's blessings upon this uh, podcast. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time of coming to worship Jesus and to share uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that that everyone that's listened will be blessed by uh, the word as we preach it. And if there's a single person that is listening that does not know Jesus as their personal Savior, I pray that I might say something that would encourage them to seek the Lord and to yield their life to him. I pray now that you'll put your words in my mouth and your thoughts in my mind so that I might say what you won't said and nothing more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week we shared with you from Matthew chapter 8 and we talked about faith and we talked about uh, the Roman centurion and the faith that he had and we give you three points with regard to faith first of all we said faith gets God's attention and certainly that Roman uh, centurion got God's attention by uh, his faith that he had in Jesus Christ not only that we pointed out to you that faith is the means whereby we are saved and then we pointed out thirdly that faith unlocks or unleashes the power of God well this morning I want to sort of continue with that thought or that idea about faith Uh, there's a lot that can be said with regard to faith and I certainly in two sermons will not be exhausting all that can be said but there are just a few things that I wanted to uh, share with you that the Apostle Paul tells us here in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 now I'm going to read all seven verses but I want to read verse number seven first before I start reading the other verses verse number seven Paul writes and says this for we walk 
by faith, not by sight. Let me repeat, let me repeat that. We walk by faith and not by sight. Now go back to verse number 5. Or excuse me, verse number 1, 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says, for we know. And there we see it in that little word, no, that's his faith. We know if our earthly house of this tabernacle, he's talking about this body that we live in. It is our earthly house, and he refers to it as a tabernacle. Some translations better say this tent in which we live. And you will remember a few weeks back in Second Peter uh, we or rather in First Peter, we talked about Peter telling us that we were pilgrims and strangers and that we're just passing through this way of life. And so Paul said that this body is like a tabernacle, it's like a tent. And he says, if it were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, how did Paul know that? I'm sure the disciples had shared with him what Jesus told them in John chapter 14. You remember, remember in that passage of Scripture, Jesus had been telling them about his coming death on the cross and that he was going to be leaving. And they were greatly disturbed and greatly troubled by what Jesus was saying. And so Jesus said to him, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I'm sure Paul was aware of that teaching of Jesus, that he was going to prepare a heavenly home because he says here that we have a building and that it is not made with human hands. Jesus is the one who prepared it, and it is eternal in the heavens. He was walking by faith and not by sight, because he had, he had, had, had literally, you know, uh, this knowledge by what the disciples had been saying unto him. Then in verse 2, he said, For in this... We groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, we that are in this tent do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life and what Paul is saying there is is simply uh, this now we're living in a mortal corruptible body uh, there are we're going to die one day the Bible just makes that plain and clear uh, the scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment but not only that we are attacked by the devil we are attacked by the world and its system of corruption. And we are attacked by our own flesh because in Galatians, Paul talked about that the flesh lusts against the spirit to control our lives. And so Paul is saying here, it's our desire and our longing that we would no longer be troubled by all of this, but that we would put on immortality and this corruptible would put on incorruption. And we'd be forever with Jesus in heaven. He goes on and he said, Now he that hath wrought us for this selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. You see, God, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary, has made it possible for us to occupy this eternal home that he is even now preparing for for us therefore verse 6 we're always confident again faith we have that strong confidence knowing that which we are that whilst we are at home in the body 
we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. And then let me just read verse 8 too. We are confident, again, here's faith. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul said, we walk by faith and not by sight. That ought to be the testimony of every single Christian. But I'm afraid that there are those that it's not their testimony. I've heard people uh, over my ministry say, yes, I'm a religious person. Well, religion is man's attempt to be right and justified in the sight of God. Uh, religion is not faith. We are to walk by faith and not by sight. Over in the Old Testament, faith could be more accurately rendered faithfulness. Uh, it indicated a firmness, a reliability, a steadfastness. The faithful Old Testament saint held confidently to his or her trust in the law of God and in the commandments that God was giving unto them. That's why Paul talked about here. He had confidence that what God had said and what Jesus had told those disciples in John 14, that he was going to bring it to pass, that he had a home waiting for him when he left this temporary home that he lived in down here on earth. When you come over to the New Testament and you talk about faith, uh, the th thought of faith is that it's an act. It's an act whereby the believer avails themselves of the gifts of God. We do it by obediently submitting ourselves to the commandments of God, abandoning all thoughts of ourselves, and trusting only in the Lord. In verse number 7 here, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, introduces faith as being in opposition to sight. He says that faith is a confident trust in the unseen power of God and Jesus Christ. Jesus supports his definition in Mark eleven twenty two 22 when he said, have faith in God. Now the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 and verse 1 gives us what many people describe as the definition of faith it says this now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen i think there's a little better definition of faith in the sixth verse of hebrews chapter 11 listen to what it says but without faith it is impossible to please him or to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, a person of faith believes that God exists. In Psalms 23, David wrote and says, The Lord is my shepherd. Many years ago, there was a, an old black preacher that took those first two words, or the first three words, the Lord is. And he said this, he said, The Lord is. He always has been is. And he always will be is. In other words, he was recognizing that God exists. So a person of faith, first of all, recognizing, recognizes that God exists. And then secondly, they earnestly seek to learn more about God through obedience to His Word. Now faith is not something 
that causes you as a Christian to sit idly by on a pew. Faith is active. It produces godly works. James wrote about that in chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, when he said this, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. There are some who say that James was saying that you're saved by works, but that's not, not what he's saying. What he is saying is that true faith is active, productive, it produces good works in a person's life. It changes a person's life life so with that said let me ask you just a few questions what has your faith produced in your life has it produced courage or has it produced fear has it produced industry or has it produced laziness has it produced purity or sinfulness has it produced joy or depression? Has it produced concern or indifference? Has it produced agreeability or crabbiness? True faith will not produce fear, sinfulness, laziness, depression, indifference, or crab crabbiness. True faith produces godly living so with this in mind let me share with you three very important statements in relationship to faith first of all we ought to examine our faith 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul said this. He says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. That is, not knowing the difference between good and evil. Self-examination is something that is taught throughout the Bible. Believers are to constantly be examining their life to make sure that they're walking in obedience to the Word of God. In Psalms 26, verse 2, David wrote this. He said, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. Uh, Paul talks about partaking of the Lord's Supper, and he said this, let a man, and that word man is generic, it literally, in the, in the Greek, it literally means man or woman. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And then in verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul said, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged examine your faith just every now and then stop and take stock of where you are spiritually speaking and how obedient are you being to the word of God now Romans 12 3 Paul tells us that God has given everybody a measure of faith but that faith has to be placed in the right object we believe something that's faith but what we believe has to be specific it has to be placed in the right object now you're sitting at home this morning and when you sat down a few moments ago to begin to watch uh, this sermon or this message you had confidence and you had faith that that chair you were about to sit in was properly built, properly engineered, and that it would hold your weight. 
Well, faith has to be directed also. And you need to be very careful what you believe in or who you believe in. Someone once told me, they said, you know, in this world in which we live, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I got news for you. In the next world, if you're planning to go home and be in heaven, the same thing is true. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Mohammed can't save you. If you place your faith in him, uh, you're fa placing your faith in a losing cause. Confucius, Buddha, all of the other false gods of this world cannot save you. So where is your faith? Where have you placed it? During this pandemic, who are you trusting? Are you trusting the expertise of all the health officials? And I've listened to a lot of them as they speak. And, and truthfully, there are times when I just got real confused because one would say one thing and then the other would say something quite opposite. And all of the models and the predictions that they were making uh, didn't seem to be coming true. Where is your faith? Is, is it in government? Is it in your bank account? Is it in the might and the strength of our military? Well, I'm going to tell you, if you plan to go to heaven, if you plan to live eternally with God, your faith must be placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 4, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Examine your faith. Who are you trusting? And what is that faith producing in your life? There's a second thing I want to speak to you just a few minutes about. And not only examine our faith, but expand your faith. In Luke chapter 17, verse number 5, the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. And we all know of Second Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 12, the prayer of Jabez. A few years back, uh, there was a preacher who wrote about that prayer, and put it in a little book and sold thousands of copies. I told my wife, I said, you know, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, I preached on the prayer of Jabez. I don't know why I didn't write a book and sell thousands of copies either, but, but Jabez, let me read you his prayer. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, enlarge my coast. In other words, he said, Lord, enlarge my faith, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. God, enlarge my coast, increase my faith. Well, how do you increase your faith? How do you enlarge your faith? Let me give you several ways. First of all, and most importantly, you do it with the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, you've heard me quote this over and over and over again. The Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I really don't know of, of, of any other sure way to guarantee that your faith is going to grow than through the Word of God. Every time you expose yourself to the teachings and the preaching of the Word of God, every time you pick up the Word of God and you begin to read it for yourself, you are increasing your faith. You are growing spiritually few years ago someone asked me this question they said brother John how is it that you know so much about the word of God well let me tell you first of all I'm no expert on the Bible but I am a little bit further down the road than I was when I first got saved when I first got saved I didn't come from a 
Christian home or a church-going family, and I knew literally absolutely nothing about the Bible. There was a deacon in the first church that I pastored that really got me into the Word of God. That's a long story, but he did. And over the years, I've spent a lot of time reading, studying, praying over it, meditating about it, and God has shown me things, and He is still showing me things and teaching me things out of this book. So I don't know everything there is to know about the Word of God, but I know more today than I did way back yonder when I first got saved. And let me just say this, and I say it in love, Anybody who neglects the reading of the Bible or exposing themselves to preaching or to the teaching of the Word of God is anemic spiritually, and you are an open target for an attack of Satan. So the best way I know to grow your faith is to study, meditate, pray over, and read the Word of God and let God speak to you. Secondly, your faith can grow from past experiences. You know, in Joshua 23 and verse 14, Joshua said this, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and in all your souls that, listen, that not one thing hath failed of all the things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing has failed. In other words, Joshua told those children of, of Israel, he said, I have looked all the way back through the history of the Jewish nation, all the way back to when God called Abram, changed his name to Abraham, and said, you go where I tell you to go, and you do what I tell you to do, and I'll bless you, and I'll make a great nation. And Joshua said, from those past experiences, I've learned that God kept every single one of those promises that he made to Abraham past experiences how has God worked in your life Jeff Gibson who is a tremendous songwriter and used to sing with a trio heaven bound some of you may remember him from years ago wrote a song and the title of that song is look what God has done for you and if you'll just stop and look back in your life and see where God has blessed you, it'll grow your faith. Thirdly, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I've already alluded to it and, and mentioned it, but you can grow your faith through prayer. The disciples asked Jesus, and literally they were praying, Lord, increase our faith. Jabez prayed and said, Lord, increase my coast, increase my faith. Faith, prayer will do wonders to your spiritual life. Someone once said, we can do nothing before we pray, but there's a lot that we can do after we pray. Number four, you can watch other people, and it'll help your faith. Over the years, I've watched people, many have struggled Many have suffered, but yet they've remained faithful and committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been a member of this church for, I guess, about two years now. Uh, when we came, it wasn't long that I learned that uh, Gina Copeland was battling with cancer. She blessed my life, even though I didn't get to know her very well. But I saw faithfulness, I saw dedication, I saw commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember a lady who came to Second Baptist, her name was Teresa Carter. And Teresa uh, developed cancer, very serious type of cancer. And even through all of her treatments and even through all of her struggles, she came to church. She was faithful stood and gave testimony time and again about how God had worked in her life. And over the years, I've seen some 
very strong and very powerful and very dedicated Christians. Not everything went the way they wanted it to go, but they trusted God because they walked by faith and not by sight. And then last but not least, let me sum up with this and say, not only are we to examine our faith and enlarge our faith, but we need to exercise our faith as well. Psalms 37, verse 7 through 9 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. We live in a nervous, restless, uncertain world. And that really has, has come to, to face us during this pandemic. Uh, people today need to feel secure. People today need peace and assurance in their heart and in their life and you can gain that by trusting God by exercising your faith just as your body needs exercise and the doctors and health group gurus are constantly telling you and and uh, telling me that we need to exercise uh, I asked my doctor a while back uh, at the house I've got a recliner that is uh, electric electrically controlled and I can push a button and lean back and push a button and raise up and I asked does that count as sit-ups of course he wasn't too impressed by that but people are told to exercise well we need to exercise our faith as well the children of Israel were standing at the Red Sea there was that obstacle of the Red Sea in front of them and behind them was the entire Egyptian army pursuing them, and the situation looked impossible. But Moses trusted God. He exercised his faith. He touched the sea with his rod, and the waters parted. And the children of Israel marched through that, those waters, not upon soggy, muddy ground, but the Bible says on dry ground. And when they got to the other side, they stood and watched as God slew the entire Egyptian army as the waters receded back upon them. The three Hebrew children exercised their faith. They walked by faith and not by sight. They wouldn't bend as the song goes. They wouldn't bow and neither would they burn, even though they were cast into a fiery furnace. You may be facing something impossible today. You don't have the solution. You don't know what to do next. This pandemic that we're in the midst of has been horrible and devastating, not only to our economy, but to the lives of many people, and many have lost their life. But there's one thing we can do in the midst of this impossibility where we don't know which way to turn. We can trust God. And when you do, you're going to see three things happen in your life. Number one, it'll give you a peace that passeth all understanding. Number two, when you trust God and you walk by faith and not by sight, it'll give you power in your prayers. And number three, it'll give you purity in your life walk by faith not by sight in the midst of what we're going through right now trust God he'll take care of you heavenly father thank you now for this time we've had in sharing this message and I pray that you'll be with our members and Lord be with us again next week when we assemble ourselves together as a church to honor Jesus and praise him for it's in his name we ask amen